You're at your old trusty boat. You call my tea sparrow. I'm in the city of Mardi Gras. Welcome to the Sailing into Oblivion podcast. I'm your host, Jerome Rand, and this is where we sit down with everyday people who do extraordinary things. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, we sit down with Davis, who goes on some very interesting, far-flung fishing adventures. Uh, But I find out, really, that uh, the fishing is only a small aspect of why he goes out and visits places like Cuba and Bolivia and other spots. It's to see the culture, to see the place, uh, and to see nature in all sorts of different forms. So a really interesting conversation. It was fantastic to have him spend a little bit of his time here. Yeah, I'll get right into it. But before I uh, do, as I always say, if you want to support the podcast, head over to Patreon. The link will be in the description. We're at the end of the month, which means... uh, that it's sort of payday, so to speak, for all of my patrons that I already have. I can't uh, thank you all enough. It really makes a huge difference uh, when it all comes to fruition like that, and it's grown this month quite a bit. The podcast as a whole has grown quite a bit, and uh, I have everybody to thank, from every listener to every Patreon person to uh, everybody who comes and sits down on my show. So thanks, Also, to everybody who writes in, because I really appreciate all the input about sales, marinas, all that other stuff. Uh, It's kind of like becoming my own little reference uh, area. So if you want to reach out to the show, head over to sailingintooblivion.com and uh, click on the podcast section and you can contact the show from there. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Davis. Welcome, Davis. Welcome, Jerome. To the podcast. This is, this is such a treat. <laughs> well, I, you know, after after seeing you the other night and uh, just barely delving into Cuba and the fishing trips and all that sort of stuff, I think we ought to just pick right back up and talk about Cuba. Well, it is. Uh, well, thank you for having me, first of all. But um, I have to say, you know, and I've done, I've been lucky enough. I've been really fortunate to have done some pretty interesting fishing, you know, throughout my 40 years or whatever of doing it. But uh, the one place that I've always found myself going back to, which I don't do uh, very often, is Cuba. And it's really because, at least in my opinion, and I think it's an opinion shared by a lot of people, um, you know, one, it, from a pure fishing perspective, I think it's got the the, the best variety and volume of, you know, saltwater fishing, reef flats fishing in the world. That, uh, do you think that's mostly uh, because it's kind of been such a hard place to get to for all these years? Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. Although what's funny about it, Jerome, and I keep having to get this into my head, is that you think you're going to this sort of uh, exclusive unavailable inaccessible place yeah and it really is the case for only americans you know uh, everyone else in the world can go there and has been going there it, you, you know oh really hey I, I guess i never thought of it that yeah, way and, and neither did i really i mean you know the the europeans the canadians the you know the, the russians uh, you know the whoever whoever uh, you know they're all free to go there it's just really the u.s by and large it's not able to do that not that that's a small market don't get me wrong but, right well we're pretty close by yeah and we're very close by um but i think also uh, and i'll give this is part of what i was going to say about how complicated cuba strikes me as being um is that uh they don't it, where we typically fish is called the garden of the gods or jardin de la reina which is about a 850 square mile national park oh wow okay off the southern coast of cuba a little bit you know sort of east central off the southern coast yeah um and it's a particularly well managed fishery um you know they the the cubans outsource the management of it through a contract with a, a company called avalon which i believe is an italian company 
you know, and you sort of have this idea that the Italians, you know, can't manage their way much of anything, but they do a terrific... Hey, I might have some Italian listeners. You know, and, I, and, and, I, and I say that in the most endearingly complimentary way, because there's no people I'd rather spend an evening with than the Italians. Yeah, so, right. You know, I mean, they're just a really fun, uh, uh, fun folks to, to be with, but they do a terrific job managing this thing. And managing the number of boats that go in there, managing how much pressure it gets. They divide that park up into three sections and basically only allow a handful of skiffs in each of those sections through the course of the season, which is basically, you know, I mean, you can fish pretty much all year there, but the, the real peak season is, is early spring to sort of early summer. Oh, know? okay, okay. Um, so I, the fishing there, I, I just... Uh, maybe because of that 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 managed pressure, uh, they don't do really um, they don't do any spin fishing that I can uh, d determine in that neck of the woods. It's all fly fishing. It's uh, all fly fishing. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I know a lot of the flats guys that were down in in like the BVI and yep. stuff. That was sort of the way to go. Was right. And and almost all of it is catch and release, unless you're you know you catch a snapper and looking for a meal. And we ate a lot of snapper on the boat. Right, um, right. But the barracuda, they're edible, but you don't really do that. And the tarpon aren't edible. The bonefish really aren't edible. Yeah, uh, yeah. The permit aren't edible. They're just mostly sort of trophy fish. And, they're just and... great, terrific fighting yeah. trophy sport fish. And the trifecta is, again, you told me the other night, but yeah, I forgot. That's bonefish, tarpon, and permit. And permit. And you try and get all those in one trip, right? And if you want to make the grant, the, the super slam, you add a snook into that. Oh, so the okay. snook is the super slam. Uh, so anyway, I uh, I love the fishing there, but equally importantly, and, and to me, fishing isn't just about fishing. It's about the adventure and where you're going and what you're seeing and how different and new is it for you. And and. Cuba always represented a very unique, um, you know, travel experience for me. You know, Havana, Havana and, and the rural areas of Cuba are just, I mean, it, 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 it blows your mind what you see when you're there. Uh, you, you know, in the, in the city of Havana, you try and imagine what it was like back in the, you know, 50s when... You know Meyer Lansky and all the people and Ernest Hemingway and everything. Yeah, we're, we're all down there. there. And, and it was really just a wonderful, wonderful, you know, vibrant place to visit. Um, I mean, I remember what was my the first went, year that you went down there? I think it was probably 15 years ago or so. Oh, okay, okay. So, so, and it, so it was technically, I suspect, uh, illegal. We had to sort of go through Cancun, um, and we had to get a, um, you know, you had to get a, 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 per, a, 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 a sort of an educational permit. Uh, right. So you, you were going under the veil of helping or supporting some local charity or nonprofit of some kind in Cuba, whether it's conservation related or religious relig you know related yeah. to the church or, or something but it was never under the pretense of going fishing um well that's helping the community anyway because yeah i mean it was a bit of a sham some... and you know you'd give you'd pay some money and that would that there's would always help. a loophole yeah there's always. always a loophole uh and you would make sure that you never got your passport stamped and all that stuff because you didn't want to come back into the u.s with a, a, a cuban stamp on your passport. right right and again, it was really the U.S. that that didn't want you there. It was not so much Cuba that didn't want you there. So yeah, it was more uh, protecting yourself from the U.S. Treasury. But anyway, it, it, you know, Havana, you go there. We move the mic just a little, yeah. little closer. There we go. When you when you go to Havana, um, you're immediately taken by how stunningly beautiful the architecture is. Yeah, um, you were saying it was. It's just beautiful beautiful uh sort of gothic you know uh european architecture and and yet it's all degrading i mean it's it's not well maintained uh and and the infrastructure is is degraded and outdated um and it's it's a very visual example of of really com the failure of communism in many ways i mean you see it all over the place with the poverty with you know the food lines um and and the the craziness by which folks are, are are compensated there as i think we talked about the other day you got a 
a cab driver making three hundred dollars a month, uh, U.S. dollars a month. Yeah. Uh, our guides on our boats uh, would make three hundred dollars a week, uh, which is an incredible amount of money yeah. for that neck of the woods. And yet, doctors and teachers will make thirty dollars a month. And the education and healthcare in Cuba is surprisingly good. And you just scratch your head and go, how is that possible? Yeah, it, it just doesn't it, make any sense. And and I think a lot of that has to do because they they, they sort of fence them in and, and really don't give them a lot of mobility. Um, you know, so anyway, I mean, you, you look at all those sort of nuances and, 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 fa and, and, the, and the people are generally wonderfully friendly and happy. I've found that throughout the entire Caribbean. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's pretty prevalent throughout. Uh, and the people are happy. They, they welcome and jump at any sort of opportunities to, you know, uh, make a business for themselves. You know, the Paladoras, which are the, the sort of privately held restaurants, you know, are trying to get it going. And, you know, there's small little examples of entrepreneurialism going on there as they slowly sort of have loosened some of the reins. But... But by and large, it, it's still a very restrictive, you know, um, closed, uh, controlled environment. Yeah. And and yet, you know, the music is just unbelievably yeah, the good. The music's great. You know, the food the, is great. The people the are beaches. friendly. Yeah, and the beaches are wonderful. The food is horrible. You would think that you could find food. That, I'm, the food's I'm, horrible? The food is horrible. Cubano uh, sandwiches? Yeah, they, they're remarkably horrible. The I, best the best food we ever had was always on the boat. You know, we would go on a boat, and then they'd bring us skiffs every morning, and so... You were well, always they, having. They fresh... might be hiding the, the yeah, good no, stuff. Yeah, no, you know, <laughs> that's, that's uh, sometimes it takes a while to find those hidden gems. It, where it, probably true. The probably locals true. Uh, we tried to go to some of those private restaurants, and they were better. They were certainly better. But I was just amazed uh, uh, how average the food was with, when you've got all that stuff around oh, you. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I. I've always enjoyed it. It's always been a treat. And seeing the rural areas, you know, the the farming and, and the, the technology or limited technology with which farming's done, even the cigar making. I mean, my God, the cigar making, uh, all the cigars are pretty much made in, in, in a, one or two factories in Havana. Yeah, all by hand, right? All by hand and on multiple floors. One floor is for, you know, the leaf separation and the next floor, you know, and they take it all the way up until... You get to that first chair I think I was telling you about. It's a hand, sort of a, a generational hand-me-down kind of thing. The the guy who gets to make the last lick or the last yeah, grab right. on the cigar is a very prestigious. It's like the first violin in a, in an orchestra. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, it's got to be perfect. That's perfect. And and they crank out something like I don't know, uh, uh, a thousand cigars or something like that a day or Every something. Day. It's, wow. It's pretty cool to see. So, anyway, it's 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 an adventure and it's it's an experience and and it's one that I I really enjoy going back to. I probably have been there eight or ten times, and I just I've never been any place eight or ten times. Yeah, yeah, because you sort of jaunt all well, over there's the a world lot to see. for these places. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. to see, you know, and there's a lot of places where you want to go and you know try different things, new adventures. But you know, Cuba sort of always kept talking. Well, about. and it's it's a big country i mean i think it's the biggest one down in the caribbean isn't it by could far be, could and be. uh so you're not always going to the exact same spots are you pretty much we are uh, oh, we, really? we may get there a little differently that the the garden of the gods that national park is is there is other places to fish but that is the area that is really the most uh right. productive uh, well i would assume the the north coast of it gets the north swell and the oh, that's good the point. east side's going to get the trade winds so that that inner sort of harbor which mm -hmm. is huge I, i'm assuming that's where you're talking it about it must be and 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 um you can get there different ways now it used to be you always had to go to havana and then you take like a six hour bus ride uh, mm -hmm. to hukuro which is where the boats were oh that's uh, where you get to see the countryside and yeah everything. so that's where you'd look out the bus window and just see the countryside yeah. and it was just I always love that. Oh, it's love the best. That it's part the best. Of any travel. Um, but uh, lately, you can now fly into Camagüey, which is you know sort of the capital, of one of the provinces down more east uh, from Havana. And, and where are you flying from now? Well, they've it, 
again, it goes kind of up and down in terms of how the uh, in terms of the access. Yeah. You know, when when uh, when Obama was in office, for example, it, it got a little less restrictive, and so you could actually fly from Fort Lauderdale on, you know, uh, I, I think it was JetBlue or something like that, right yeah. into Camagüey, and then you know it's a two-hour bus ride to Hukuro and. Uh, well, your... that was that was about the same time that I started hearing about other cruisers. Uh, mm -hmm. talking about going to Cuba and how how unbelievably untouched it was and and um, all that stuff it's still I think I don't think I ever heard a story that was like it was easy to get in there and there weren't a lot a few issues for an American flag boat that was still the yeah if you're a captain on an American flagged boat you know like a center console going down from fort lauderdale yeah Cuba. right I think that's probably a challenge. well and even sailboats because sailboats i there's uh this great sailor his name's john kretschmer and he does uh he's i think he's one of the great american skippers of our time he, really people pay him tons of money to take them out across the atlantic in the winter time to see what heavy weather sailing is really all about. No kidding. And does he use his own boat or is, they off, is he often he, cap skippering? He does it, it on deliveries. He does it on his own boats. No uh, kidding. I mean, and he's written very prolifically um, At the Mercy of the Sea, um, Cape Horn to Starboard. I mean, he's... he's He's the man. He is the man. He doesn't. Uh, it's. I. I think I only compliment him so much because he's not really a solo sailor, so he's in <laughs> sort of a different, you know, thing. But I. I think I. I tip my hat to him because when you take other people on the boat, that's a heck of yeah. a lot more responsibility. You, you know, it's one thing to just go out there by yourself, and if something happens, but, and he's been doing this for years. But he. How old a guy is he? Uh, he's got to be mid to late 40s i think oh. probably just a little older than i am um i could be way off on that he might be in his 50s but i'm gonna give him credit yeah okay. yeah but uh he there's one book where he talks about going down to cuba to pick up a boat and you know they he has a vhf radio in his bag and that causes this huge amount of trouble and they're like why do you have that vhf and why do you need a radio and this would have been probably like late 90s yeah. maybe something like that but uh yeah i don't know it, it seemed like it was this ultimate destination for a while but i i never heard of just a nice smooth easy in and out and well that was pretty unusual normally uh we would have to go through you know some go through toronto uh cancun nassau uh, is yeah. another entry point um, so yeah, that was an unusual period where, uh, and the very first time I went, uh, we, uh, went to Cancun, I think I mentioned, and we got on these old, you know, Russian jets that, uh, you know, <laughs> commercial jets that <laughs> really, flew, I mean, it, it had the wooden, you know, toilet seat and, uh, oh my gosh, you know, all the, the, the overhead lighting and everything else and flight attendant buttons and everything else was in Russian and um oh that must have been kind of cool and they a had little no, worrying but they had cool. no overhead compartments that were closed they were all open you know it was yeah. just strings sort of holding everything up <laughs> and they would spray dry ice or something to cool the plane down so it was always filled with it you almost felt like you were at a you know a Def Leppard concert or something <laughs> like that but god it was uh, yeah it was a little nerve-wracking you know I can't remember what the names of the planes were but they they were very oh, that'd old. Be interesting. Yeah. Jeez. But no, I, 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 I would recommend any, even if you're not a fisherman, uh, I would recommend, and they do, people are doing, uh, I, I've, I've got some friends who have, have biked there for, uh, you know, a couple of weeks where they'll, oh, they'll, yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll do, like do a big bike tour, yeah, big right. bike, you know, f across the Island. Uh, so any chance you can get to get to Havana and, um, and or get to the out, uh, out out outside of the city uh, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty neat and uh and you just wonder how how it's going to evolve you know the russians have sort of given up a lot of their support they can't afford to you look at the russian embassy and it's kind of you know degraded and, yeah, yeah. Um, you know you just wonder how sustainable it all is i mean obviously the castros have given up power and They've uh, passed along to one of their uh, deputies, and and you just, it's it's going to be interesting to see. You know, there's a, a continuing and growing sort of itch from the people there to, to be allowed to 
you know join the rest of the world yeah so no it seems like that so but I, there is i you know i always think of and i i've never been to cuba but like we said uh when we talked before dominica is mm -hmm. has a lot of similarities i think and and it's it's untouched in a lot of ways i think because it doesn't have the typical big sandy beaches and protected harbors for boats and great areas for big resorts and such. And so it's, it's always, and it's super mountainous really. and it, it's essentially sort of gone unnoticed. Whereas it's neighbors, Guadalupe and Martinique have exploded with, you know, development and all that sort of stuff. And, and people come in and buy huge swaths of the island. Dominica has just relatively stayed the same. And when you go to Roseau, is that largely capital, because it's just maybe viewed as not as attractive? I mean, without the beaches and all that stuff, it's yeah, not, it, doesn't, I, it doesn't fit the criteria. I guess. I mean, it, you know, when, when I'm in there, I stay in a, the Harbor of Portsmouth and it's just a half moon bay, a few miles across. And it's, it's the only inkling of protection now if you get a north swell the boat's going to be rolling and rocking like crazy to the point where you almost leave and have to go somewhere else no kidding um and that's you know compared to a place like guadalupe or grenada or any of those i mean you've got a million little coves and inlets that you're super protected and they sort of give birth to these little harbor towns and mm -hmm. all that well in dominica yeah it's, it's definitely different but it it in some ways i think that's what's kept it such a unique spot where you can go there and you really get the feel for what the Caribbean used to be like. Um, wow. And, I, you're, you're making me intrigued to want to oh, visit it's, there. It's, you know, and it, it's one of those. any good there? You uh, know? we know they do, they do a lot of, uh, like local fishing stuff. They do a lot of whale watching cause the sperm whales. I um, bet there's probably pretty breed. good sport fishing, you know, maybe for, uh, Oh, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, know, for, uh, marlin or, or the hard part is or... there's no real big harbor for any of these boats to stay Got it. so even in uh in portsmouth there's one dock which is the the customs dock mm -hmm. and that's pretty much it there's i guess there's one teeny little other dock but the idea of having a big pier with a bunch of fingers and a whole bunch of boats like tied up to it's, it's, just, it's not happening and um, i think they've talked about wanting to do that but i mean it's it's a pretty drastic infrastructure sort of thing and they did i believe they traded their the rights for their fishing grounds to the chinese in exchange for infrastructure like roads and things like huh. that and they get because they get blown out pretty hard um maria hit them pretty bad i was gonna say hurricane season probably is oh yeah and and david i think was the last one that like everybody remembers and i think that was in the 70s okay. but i mean this place is so mountainous that the it's it's not really the winds or the waves it's the rainfall and they get these flash floods where half of a mountainside just comes <laughs> cascading down and then houses and villages are basically cut off for weeks if not months and it's it's wow. really yeah i mean when i was there i think it was even two years or a year after uh hurricane maria there were still bridges that there were completely out and you know they built these little tiny things to get across and stuff but it's absolutely devastating but it, it's just like i said i mean it's just got this cut off i don't want to say prehistoric because it's not the word but just this this old time feel to it because it hasn't it just doesn't fit that criteria for mass development you know of, you're not going to find a ritz carlton there no <laughs> no definitely not i mean there, there are a few hotels that have seemingly popped up that seem to be pretty empty and i think the word on the street down there was that a lot of them are just like sort of tax haven <laughs> sort of things that that people are Part their money yeah i mean i was down there at one point and they there were there were some pretty bad riots um they burnt down some buildings what's the structure of government or do you have any idea uh it's i mean it's it's definitely they have elections um gosh i want to say I, you see them when you're there during that time it's either the blue or the red kind of pretty much like like here um, is it french or is it uh Oh no, it was English, English and then I'm pretty sure they're they're just completely separate, but Okay, not under no colonial or Right, right. And when when I was there years ago, they were still 
from what I understood, the guy who was in charge, you know, had to have a huge set of like bodyguards all the time. Yeah. I mean, it was just really corrupted sort of, yeah. sort well, of. Well, I think that's what uh, frustrates a lot of people in Cuba too. I mean, it, it, there's no shortage of corruption there too. Um, you know, uh, and it, 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 there's a lot of dissatisfaction with, you know, the way things are run, you know, the reliability of the infrastructure, whether it's power, whether it's water, whether mm -hmm. it's whatever. Um, and uh, just sort of this perpetuation of, of unproductive, you know, unsatisfactory. It's like stagnant. Cause stagnant, yeah. It just, uh, and, and I can't imagine that that can just be tolerated indefinitely, but somehow it's been it, for it, 60 years you know yeah it, it, it it'll go on and on well but you know if you've if you had guns into the mix and one side has yeah, pretty much all the power and the other doesn't yeah it's pretty hard to uh and i i don't know what any of the the laws are down there but if the population as a whole isn't really allowed to have weapons and the only people that do are are the government and the police that's always yeah, that's uh, the odds are stacked against. Yeah, you. yeah, exactly. The other place that that I went that I will mention that I thought was pretty interesting uh, was in Bolivia, which is again oh, sort really? of a, a you know a, a, a different style of governing there as well. You yeah, know, pretty autocratic. Um, <coughs> and um, excuse me, we I did that trip actually a couple of times, um, and we flew into Santa Cruz, and then you take a little. Cessna 206 or whatever to a, a landing strip. But the, the neat part about that trip was, uh, and these are rivers, uh, there's sort of three big rivers in this region that feed into the Amazon, the, the, oh, Secure, okay. the Secure, the uh, Pluma, and the Agua Negra. Um, what and, sort of altitude are we talking? Are you up in that's the mountains? A good, yeah, that's a good question. I don't I don't know that it was too high. You can see the, the mountains, but I don't yeah. know that w we were very high. Um, but you fish for these uh, beautiful, uh, very striking, uh, very carnivorous uh, fish called Golden Dorado. Um, oh. And uh, big, huge jaws, but just strikingly gold uh, bodies. And they can get up to 30 pounds. And um, But what was an interesting piece of that is that they the the fishery there is in a, a, an area that's that was that is occupied by the Samani tribe mm -hmm. and these uh oh, I've heard uh the guy who's who does that meat eater podcast and uh that show he goes up there could be yeah yeah, yeah sorry sorry to interrupt. Well, I've no, just heard they, that name so before. I mean they're, they're uh you know they're they're still very much hunter gatherers still yeah. and and so you're hanging out with them well the, the, yeah i mean there uh there's a, an argentine company that established a partnership with the tribe right cuz it's their land it's their land and and their resources and yeah. because they were hunter gatherers you know they were they were eating everything around them including the dorado uh and so they established this partnership that said you leave the dorado alone you know, we'll bring in clients to fish them. You know, we'll provide some economic support to your villages. We'll make your some of your tribesmen guides for the for the boats. You can work in our lodges, help us construct the lodges. They have, I think, three or four lodges is in the area yeah. uh, on each of the rivers. Um, but to watch uh, these natives um, in their element. Uh, whether it's being able to hear the plane coming in five minutes before I can hear the right, plane coming right. in. They don't need polarized glasses. They can see the fish uh, as clearly, if not more clearly, than than the guides, the Argentine guides who have polarized glasses. Jeez. Their their sense of hearing and sight is is remarkable. Um, they make all the all the canoes that you're in and they they pull them themselves they never wear shoes and their feet are really tough uh, uh, remarkably tough. oh i'm sure 
And, I'm sure their their toes are spread out oh, like fingers of almost. They, I mean, they almost look like hands. I yeah, mean, yeah, just yeah. incredible. Well, if you're bouncing around on rocks all the time, all I mean, the time, you have to grip them. Yeah. And they make their own bow and, bow and arrows, and they will shoot these sabalo, which are the bait fish for the for the dorado. Um, anything that moves, uh, they're going after. I, yeah. I'll never forget this story or this moment when I was we, me and another guy, we were in the canoe going down the river. And there's a there's the Argentine guide, and then there's either one or two uh, Samanis with you, mm -hmm. uh, steering the boat and guiding. Um, and there were two white storks sitting up in a tree. And this guy uh, in the back of the boat saw them, um, and he had this little. It was not very big, but it was like a twenty-two rifle but it was all put together with chicken wire and yeah, and yeah, yeah the right. thing even worked <laughs> and this boat's moving i don't know down the river probably at i don't know five knots or something like that or maybe yeah. not that fast and just on the run shoots this stork in the tree the stork opens its wings and they just get fixed because he's obviously you know already dead yeah. yeah and he just crash lands into the beach across the way the spouse apparently they mate for life the spouse yeah. comes down to join the stork uh and stands next to the fallen stork and they take out that stork and bring both storks into our canoe and by the next day everything in that stork was used except the feet i mean they Jeez. used all the feathers they they ate all the meat uh I oh mean, heck yeah i mean it was and there was a what what do you call the uh uh oh the taper it's a sort of a uh, uh it's like a, a big pig but oh even okay bigger it's yeah a, i mean one of those was running in the water and these guys took off trying to catch that thing um and they couldn't do it but my point is you, you sit in the in at nighttime and you can hardly hear any wildlife because within their region they've taken they've most taken of the wild, most of all, all that stuff well uh, it, you, you know you have to be in that mindset of like these woods are my grocery store totally because there is nowhere else that i'm getting we would take pictures of these kids they had never had their picture taken before most of the people had no idea how old they were yeah um, yeah and what was great and this is a classic story of sort of the ingenuity of and and just sort of the knowledge and and history of this tribe is that they're one of the, what the first lodge we stayed at the first year was pretty close to the river um and it was much further down towards the banks of the river than any of the other villages and villagers houses that we would see along the river yeah and we got a lot of rain uh, as a matter of fact we couldn't fish the last couple of days because there was so much rain um and the river really did rise a lot and so anyway we left and came and we were going to come back because we missed a couple of days of fishing and the outfitter said we'll make a deal for you to you know give you some credit for that and all that stuff and that lodge got taken out by the river it just blew it away oh really and the villagers you could tell said you know you shouldn't be building that yeah close to yeah it. right they know they'd seen it before they've they'd been seen told it before. about it I, trust me they sort of said you, you don't want to build it there and the next lodge they built was much higher off the bank than <laughs> yeah, that they built before so i just <laughs> see you know i mean it just the, the, the well there's the wisdom that's uh, all that wisdom that has been gathered through the you know years and years and years so, well and i i think in that in that sort of respect i mean i i always talk about people ask about like your your mindset when you're out in the ocean by yourself for a long, long time. <laughs> and one of the things that I talk about is this sort of low level input focus that you get into. And I mean, it, it, for example, when I'm, when I'm sort of half sleeping and stuff, if, if just the smallest pin and, and the whole world around me can be wavy and noisy with wind and all this sort of stuff. But if there's one sound out of place, it will wake me up, snap me out of whatever daydream I'm in, and I know that something's wrong. And then instantly I have to get up there and do it. And, you know, my life is is sort of shrunken down into this little tiny boat and this world around me. But I become so sort of it's, it's tuned my, in. Yeah, I'm tuned into it and I my whole life is just centered around it. And although I don't know what's going on in the rest of the world and all these things that, that we know day to day 
probably far more than we ever should uh, in our normal lives. But out there, uh, I think it's kind of similar to how those guys are living in the woods where yeah, they... It's, it's life and death in yeah. many respects. It's sustainability. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm curious how... Uh, is that something that you, it took a while to acquire while you were on the sea? And is it something that goes away when you get back in Jerome town? Or, uh, yeah, uh, well, it, it is. It, it typically takes about five days to 10 days for my brain to sort of slow down and stop reaching for my phone or, or you right. know, sort of the normal but your things. senses, the acuity of your senses and that listening and that, that seeing. Yeah, and... that, that comes up. Pretty quickly, because it only takes a couple of days of being sort of isolated on this boat before right. you're you're pretty much in it. And you, because you're not sleeping a normal sleep pattern. Yeah, you're sleeping with one eye open, sort of, right? Pretty much. I mean, I rarely ever will go as, as deep into sleep that I'm, I'm having these real crazy dreams and such. Every once in a while, if I'm really exhausted and, and the boat and the weather lets me just keep sleeping. In the sleeping. doldrums or something? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, interesting enough, the doldrums, unless it's just gone completely flat calm, and it's going to be like that for days. The doldrums are usually so changeable uh, that close. just like, when you get comfortable in your bunk and you're like, oh, this bang, is going to be great. Changes, yeah, yeah, all of a sudden something happens. It's really the 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 trade winds where you, you know, there have been times where I've gone 12 days with only doing two sail changes. Wow. Yeah. I mean, day and night, just wow. the same sails are up and we're just boosting along because the wind's, you know, 18 to 20 knots and it just stays Steady. that same dry. Oh, yeah. I mean, but it, it actually, that, those times kind of get a little bit boring um, because besides your routine daily checks, if everything's sailing the way it should, there's less wear on the rigging and on the sails. And so you're not... You're not finding chafe that you have to deal with, and you do your morning check, and everything's the same. It's as almost it was. like autopilot. Yeah, 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 exactly. And you know, I you obviously have to sort of really push away from becoming complacent, right? Because you never want to do that. But you know, that's where you really. I've learned that no matter where you are and how far you have to go, or how soon you might be back, always save a good pile of books. Just in case. <laughs> that way, if you didn't get you, in those situations. As I recall, didn't you, you had an iPad or so, you had downloaded a bunch of books, but they hadn't all downloaded or you you didn't have as many as you had hoped um, to have or something like that? Oh, no. I think I, I know what you're talking about. I had downloaded a ton of like really long form podcasts. Right. And the, the iPad was set in such a way that when you finished one, it deleted it. And, you know, I was out there for so long, 271 days, I listened to the the remainder of the ones that I had because I caught it after about two weeks because I, I went back. Because there's a lot of times you turn something on and then you have to go and change a sail so you don't right. actually hear the whole thing. And so I went back and I was like, where's that podcast? It was actually a, a radio lab called the Rhino Hunter. I don't know if you've ever heard that one, but it's uh, mind blowing it's about trophy hunting in oh, africa and, well it's it's basically the guys not to go off on the tangent but like he's he says you know with, without me going over there and doing this and paying you know quarter million dollars to do it these all these rhinos are going to be dead right because we're paying for the protection of the rest of these. And I mean, there's a whole lot of, there's, yeah. you know, there's, there's two sides to all that. Yeah, but, interesting uh, side to the story that doesn't get told very much. Oh my gosh. Well, it's, it's really is incredible. It's, um, yeah, shoot. I don't know what number episode is, but it's radio lab and it's called the rhino hunter. And it, it just, it, uh, it was one of those things where it opened my eyes up. I was like, Oh, I had, I had Never no thought idea. Of it that way. Yeah, yeah. It's right. like, Holy smokes. And with this case, I guess with with these rhinos, and I don't know if they were black rhinos or what, um, but I guess once a rhino, a male rhino, gets to a certain age and it can't reproduce anymore, they become very violent and they start just trying to kill other rhinos that can reproduce and all uh -huh. this stuff. And so it's kind of like they need to get rid of the thing anyway. And I don't know. Like I said, I don't want to get off into the weeds. Well, no, but, but I, you, I, know, I, you know, I do find it interesting when you're on that boat having to, and I and I saw that with these with these Samanis, uh, you know, their the the acuity and 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 sensitivity of their senses was yeah. just remarkable. I mean, I couldn't remarkable. even imagine. I mean, I I'm w up here just in Jerome Sound, like this morning, I'm up right around sunrise and such, and. There, there must have been six or seven deer that, that walked by. 
squirrels are ripping around all over the place. But even that, I don't think I'd be able to survive out here. I'm sure one of those guys probably could. <laughs> like if the house wasn't over there, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be able to do that. I, well, I know I couldn't do it out at sea. I don't think I, if yeah, I. But they, you're raising it in, in terms of connecting it to your time on sea. And, it, and it's interesting how your brain adapted immediately because it's seriously life and death where you're out there. That's true. You yeah. know, your senses had to be heightened uh, because you missed that pin drop or you, because that may be a linchpin or something. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, you, uh, it carries a level of importance that, you know, isn't the case when you're in Jerome town. Right. No, exactly. Here it's pretty luxury <laughs> yeah. uh, for, I'll, for I'll being in the woods. That. Yeah. You're very lucky. <laughs> well, there was, there was a point, um, it was, in, so in the Southern ocean, one of the things that happens, you know, obviously you get these big storms that roll through, but there are all these, these low pressure systems. And when it passes, then you typically are becalmed. But you still have really big rolling swell for yeah, a while. Yeah, it's like any front that comes through here. Or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah, usually but a calm after it, you know, to the to the next degree as far as what's left over that you have to deal with. And um, normally you would leave your mainsail up and let it slat so that the boat at least stays pretty level. If you take that down, you have no sails up, and you're in 10, 10, 12 foot swell. Can't imagine. I mean, we're talking thirty to forty degrees both both ways, and everything down below, no matter how how tight you store it and all that stuff, gonna... it breaks free and starts rolling around and doing anything. But I can remember, um, you know, letting it go for a little while. The mainsail would slat, and there's a big stainless steel track that runs on the mast, and it just I would hear these little heads of these rivets when they would pop off and hit the deck and i mean we're talking a like tenth a the bearing. size of a penny yeah, yeah. Right. and and made out of, i think they were stainless steel but they were really thin and that's how you know that's how sort of acute you get which means your mainsail is oh it's basically every time because sven built that thing so strong that every time you know, it would flat from one side to the other because it wasn't stretching at all. It was all that it's all force that pressure and force on that straight on, on that, that track. Yeah. yeah. So everywhere where there was a little, um, a little slide that was connected to the sail, that's where it would pop them off. And would they? So you, did you have to fix that or just <coughs> reattach it? Uh, I I think I put in a few new rivets that were a bit lower down. Um, it was kind of a pain for sure. Cause they, you really have to use a pretty big rivet gun, like this big one that you're like, not the wow. little tiny one. And, uh, but it was more about sort of changing the position of where those slides sit. And more than anything, it was, if it got really bad like that, you just had to grin and bear it and take the mainsail down. And then and just have a thirty roll. or forty degrees either yeah. way. Yeah. And I, I think to be honest, when, when I tell people that, you know, I, I pretty much ran out of alcohol 120 days in or something like that. That was a big part of it because you'd, you'd be sitting there in this miserable, horrible condition. You're not moving at all. Forecast is showing you've got to sit there for another day. Oh. And you've got a fully stocked bar over there. <laughs> it's sort of, and you're in the Southern Ocean. There's nobody around. I don't know. For me, it was a no brainer. And I talk about that in the book. I'm like, you know, my, my, my solution to this problem was just to have a couple of drinks. Yep. You know, yep. at least get you to sleep a little faster. Well, I, yeah, <laughs> no, I, we've, we've talked a lot about your trip and I, uh, I, I just can't fathom uh, all that you had to uh, adjust to, adapt to, manage, you know, whether it's the loneliness, whether it's the the risks, you know, uh, whether it's the, you know, your own, you know, hygiene and health. I mean, wearing layers and layers of those clothes. No, and it's be, just I mean, filthy. I mean, it just, I, I, I have to assume that that, so exceeded your expectations, even if, even if you had a pretty good sense of what you were getting into. Well, it, it did for sure. I mean, it, it blew me away in, in a lot of respects, it's, it's especially some of the things that, you know, I sort of screwed up on, like not having antibiotics and things like that. And when you get way out there, 
as much as I don't like to sit there and dwell on what could happen, right? you know, the thoughts sort of, you start being like, geez, you know, I don't have a lot of food left or geez, I, I don't have, like if I get cut and it gets infected, I don't know what I'm going to actually do. And, you know, and you can, you can, you can get focused on that pretty easily if you're oh, not careful. <laughs> twist your brain right up. Well, and that's, you know, that that's one thing that I was fairly confident that, my brain would be able to handle the solitude. I didn't, I, on that first trip, I didn't even for a second really think that I would ever like go crazy or anything like that, but it does happen. I yeah, mean, sure. it, it absolutely does. But, you know, I, I think for that whole trip, people, whenever they ask, you know, why would you do that? I think after all this time, I, I can confidently say that the biggest reason was that I wanted to experience all of that. Right. I wanted to see what it was like to be at sea for months and months and months and yep. wanted to be down in this scary place called the Southern Ocean and see what that was like. And I definitely got my, I got more than I asked for. Well, you That's really for have sure. to want to do it to yes. do it in the first place. Oh, 100%. Um, There's I, a lot of misery in there. A yeah, I know. And I would also assume that once you got through it and knowing what could have happened i mean when you've got 15 20 foot waves or waves the size of a hotel they yeah. happen to not yeah. hit your boat mm -hmm. but could have hit your boat I yeah, mean, yeah yeah you can't navigate your way away from those or whatever well, I mean, and at some point you got to go down below and take a take a snooze well wow, right. it's just i mean doing so that. i i just uh I, I remember asking you if you'd known all the risks and, and, and really understood all the risks that you were undertaking to do the trip, would you have done it? And I think your answer was probably not, but that wouldn't have prevented me from wanting to go. I mean. Right, right. Well, and I mean, you know, I say that, but it's, it's one of those things where I think it's, and my mom always describes it. Like, you know, you give birth, it's the most painful, horrible thing. Pain has no memory. But then, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, like, you wouldn't have a second kid. <laughs> exactly. It's that certain amount of time goes by, and you're like, you know, it wasn't that bad right. out there, right. was it? Let's go try and go around Cape Horn again. Well, and I, you know, in, to a much lesser degree, um, and I've just always subscribed to the idea that there's a really big world out there. And, yeah. And, and there's a lot of different ways that people live, and a lot of different environments in which people live and uh, a lot of different ways that people live in their culture and, and all that stuff. And, you know, I just have a curiosity to just see what some of that stuff is like, you know, whether it's the Somani tribe or whether it's, you know, going to Cuba and seeing what those, uh, what that community is, is up to and how they, how they live their day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, you tend to get sort of in a little bit of a bubble here in the... In the well, you can, yeah. And I, I I, know I myself have even said it a few times where I'm like, man, you know, still a lot of stuff in the States I haven't even seen. Right. But there is something to be said when you make that leap and you get out of the country and you really see a big difference. Because, you know, we are spoiled. We've got the difference between the north, the south, the east coast, the west coast, Texas, Florida, Maine. I mean, it's it's like its own continent, essentially. Um, yeah. And well, it almost we, is. Shoot. We, relatively speaking, have an embarrassment of riches. And Oh, absolutely. Uh, you get to Dominica, you get to Cuba, you get to the Somani tribe in Bolivia, you get to, you know, parts of Asia, Indonesia, and all that stuff. And it's just... It's fascinating to me. You yeah. Know, it's fascinating to me to just see how the rest of the world, as best you can, you know, lives and functions. And, and there's just a lot to see out there. And I, I push it on my kids as best I can to, you know, if they are fortunate enough and lucky enough to be able to get out and see a little bit of the world, I mean, jump on it. Because it's, get it's out a pretty fascinating damn place. I mean, there's a lot of fascinating places to see. Oh, man. Well, I, we did a uh, a delivery. Gosh, this was mid-2000s, I guess, taking a boat from the Caribbean over to Turkey. And, you Perfect. know, we went to a lot of different spots. It took us like 40 days to get there. Oddest thing in the world, though. Was, when did you do this? This was... Uh, it must have been 2006 or seven, maybe hmm. something like that. I'd have to look at my journal, but uh, this is like a nice boat, like 98 feet. Wow. We get over there. We pull into Turkey in the morning 
And then there is almost a total eclipse of the sun. Oh my God. That afternoon. And I believe that's what they have on their flag. So it was just this odd, crazy coincidence. But before I left, so my job was basically to help deliver this boat over there. And then I was going to fly back. And uh, I had asked the, the, the guy who was the captain at the time, you know, if it was possible to go to Istanbul. Scared me half to death. Just the thought of going, you know, small town Jerome going right. to Istanbul, which is one of the biggest cities and you know it's right on the border of europe and yep. asia yep and i just sort of gutted it up i was like i'm never going to be here again probably and i just went for it and i spent three i think three nights there and the first two days sort of exploring on my own and then the last day i sort of was like man i, I don't have a lot of time i'm gonna get a guide and it was the best decision i've ever Full made of history oh my god and we just went to so many places i would have never known about and got That's what in it's all about oh she's having having that local wisdom sort of guide you into an area i mean it was unbelievable absolutely unbelievable and just it, it made for i don't know i don't want to say a better experience because there's something to be said for striking off on your own i right. think but definitely very memorable because then you had sort of a partner in crime as well well, but a place like that is just so rich in history that, oh my God. The Blue Moss, when I turned the corner and saw that for the first time, I mean, talk straight out of like Star Wars, like, yeah. <sighs> unbelievable. And the size of the, just the sheer magnitude when you walk into these mosques and the pillars are bigger around than this tent that we're sitting in. And they're hundreds of years old and you just oh. think of, you know, the, the construction yeah how, how long it took how many people it took it's uh, unreal yeah absolutely unreal but you can't you know you can <clears throat> you can sit there and look on a computer screen and and Doesn't look at the justice. stuff and read about it all you want yeah. but once you get there yeah it's like the pyramids or the sphinx or have you seen the pyramids i have wow i'm jealous i've never and, never and that you know you look at it and you go how the hell in that day and age yeah did they make that and and to hear the story, and we were lucky enough to have had a guide to do it. Yeah, um, I mean it's fascinating. I mean it is just fascinating how they how they and it took a long time, but it was very methodical. You know, and it was sort of a circular. You know, I believe if I recall correctly, kind of construction where they just oh just keep the, zipping them up. Yeah, it was just fascinating, and uh, the ingenuity and uh, I I don't know. I just uh, to me that. That's just wonderful stuff to see and, and learn. Oh, yeah. Well, and you there's there's just no way you can appreciate it unless you're actually right there. Right. And, and even like, some of the natural wow. stuff. I mean, I, uh, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the natural wonders of the world, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I used to do a fishing trip every, every, every early June and outside of Telluride uh, down the Black Canyon. And it's, you know, it's not, you know, anything you know, true, truly remarkable. But these, these canyon walls are, uh, in, uh, in which the Gunnison River runs, I mean, they're a thousand feet straight up in the air on either side. I mean, it's like a, it's like a big, huge hallway, but, you know. And you about, down to the bottom of and, it. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, you look up and it, it's just astonishing. And, and you just go, God, this is mother nature at its best. I yeah. mean, it's just incredible. And there's stuff like that in the U.S. There's stuff. I mean, you. Well, we got the Grand Canyon. Grand that Canyon's one, a perfect example. We wear I mean, that on our shoulder, you know. But I mean, how suckers. spectacular is that? I mean, it takes your breath away. I've been down it twice. Have you really down the Colorado? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once was halfway when I was like 12, and then I was very fortunate to get yeah, invited. Yeah, because those permits aren't easy to get. No, yeah, well, we went with an organized um, yeah, guided trip of, but it was all on the small. Um, rubber raft? Yeah, the small rubber raft, maybe five people in each one. Yeah. But That's the some second heavy time, water you're going through. Well, the the second time we went, uh, it was 2004, I think. So I was in my 20s and could appreciate it a little more, I guess. But when we went there, the first four days they had monsoon rains. Oh my God! So I mean, really we're talking dead cattle floating down the river, it's all bloated. Roaring. It wiped out a few wastewater treatment plants. No kidding. Just the the they look like chocolate milk running down yeah, there. I'm sure. But some of those, I mean, it, I, I can't remember what the exact stats were, but I believe 
Colorado usually runs between like seven and nine thousand feet per second. I think we were up in the forty-five thousand. Forty-five CFS. Oh, it was huge. I mean, they these guys Fast were five looking water at the whole way down. Just like well, <laughs> but a lot of them actually got wiped out. Um, I don't know if you've ever read that book, uh, The Emerald Mile. It's I, about the I record the setting yeah, I know, one. I, I know of the book. I have yeah. not read it, but I know the book. That that makes me every time I peel into that just for a little bit, it makes me want to go back and do one more trip down the Colorado. But those are you know that, that that's just magnificent topography around there. It, and you're just you don't even have to do anything. You're just sitting there watching it float by. Oh my gosh! And there's stuff like that all over the world. Yeah. I mean, every uh, anyway, I I just. Uh, yeah, oh, we could go on and on and on. I no, mean, but that just creates that itch, you know, where you just yeah, if you're yeah, yeah. fortunate enough to be able to do it, and and even if it's within the U.S., you know, there's plenty of ways to see a lot of remarkable things. Absolutely. And, yeah, so we're very fortunate. What's the uh, outside of uh, some of the places you've talked about now? What what's like the furthest removed from civilization you've you've gotten on one of these trips? Well, certainly the the trip to Bolivia where we got with the Samani tribe that was pretty remote. Yeah, um, you know, uh, we've done some stuff, uh, and I don't. This probably doesn't. We've done some stuff in, in uh, you know northern Quebec and uh, Labrador and and oh, things that's like out that. there, yeah, and, yeah, and that's uh, you know. Uh, Would that be up in the Arctic Circle? Pretty close. Pretty darn yeah, close. Pretty right? close. Uh, and uh, so that. Y y y even even Alaska, for that matter. I mean, you want to talk about the last frontier? That the, the, I mean, you're amazed at the amount of terrain uh, when you get to northern Quebec or up, you know, that whole northern half of yeah, yeah, of, yeah. of Canada. I mean, it just I'm astonished at, at how much terrain is out there, and it's just empty. Absolutely I mean, empty. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> empty. And you can't you can't. It kind of it's like. You, you sort of think about it and imagine it, and it's four times more than you thought. And uh, it just takes, again, it takes your breath away when, you, when, you, when you're in a position like that. And, and to your point, and I've got a friend who I do those trips with, it takes him a day or two to settle in. He gets very sort of anxious to mm -hmm. be so remote. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's not something that can come easy to everybody. No, no. Well, I like I said, I mean, I... I always am pretty skittish that first day oh, when I, I set imagine. sail because I'm sort of like, is what is everything? Do I have everything ready? <laughs> Nothing's leaking, right? <laughs> this is working, right? Because pretty soon I'm going to be I'm in the middle be, of the Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be 100 miles away by tomorrow morning. Yeah, no, I. you have to have the stomach for it and it takes some adjustment. Uh, it doesn't bother me too much. I mean, I can't possibly fathom being in the middle of an ocean where there's 12 whatever million square miles yeah of, well that's an oddball that's an outlier that's, well but know. still i mean you want to talk about a speck yeah on a, a speck yeah on oh a yeah very, well i i got within uh i think 30 miles of point nemo so that's the farthest you can get away from land on the planet and that <laughs> you're at that exact spot and it's deep in the south pacific uh i think you know it's it's like Easter Island, and then maybe one other island, and then Antarctica. Those are those are on the radius, so to speak. But it's it's about that eight. I, that that I can't possibly fathom. But uh, that one, well, and you know what? It's funny because people people typically describe Cape Horn as the Mount Everest in sort of sailing yeah. world. Mm -hmm. I think that Point Nemo is the Everest of the sailing world because it's the farthest you can get. I mean, it's the just like Everest, the highest. This is the farthest, and then. I've always thought of Cape Horn as uh, like Mount Mount Olympus, and I'm I'm sort of uh, influenced by this old old sailor Bernard Motissier, who was one of the greats, and uh, he was very poetic and often described as uh, writing as if he was on like LSD because of his you know poetic descriptions right, of right. These, these things. But very he always said he was like it's more like Mount Olympus because. It's like holy water there. It's a it's a hallowed place, and it's it's a place of gods and men and all this sort of sure. stuff. I don't know. Yeah, but I uh, I can't possibly fathom being uh, Nemo. Just sounds 
I don't know. It, it takes a certain. When I was there, it was foggy. It looked like any other day. I could have been off the coast of Cape Cod. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it was good. It was foggy. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? No panic attack. Oh man. Well, we're already uh, at an hour. Believe it or not, goes no by kidding. pretty fast. Doesn't yeah, that? It always is fun talking with you, man. Hey, it's a, my my pleasure. I thank you. I always tell my guests that. You know, time, our time is the most precious thing we have more than anything other by far. And when you give me an hour of it, I'm very appreciative. Well, uh, back at you, my friend. It's a, it's a treat. And thank you so much for including me. I, you're even thinking of me. I, I'm hey, flattered. and kidding uh, me? I, I Cultured enjoyed... man as yourself, <laughs> adventurer. Oh, hey, does that, do you have anything planned for this uh, winter? Uh, let me think. Uh... uh may go down to uh down to chile uh, oh really yeah um friend of mine has a lodge down there about uh uh two-thirds the way down yeah uh, so pretty far down uh and it, it, terrific uh, uh you know scenery yeah oh in yeah the middle All of the mountains Andes, and you know, everything yeah and, and it's uh these these lakes are just beautiful and the brown trout are huge and so that's what i always big. heard yeah um, it's a trout and i've been there once before so yeah i may take a uh, a run down there because that's really it's hard to get to it takes a long time but the the people again you know it is just such a, a wonderful environment a lot of wind so the fishing is is challenging but oh i'm sure yeah. that's okay uh but it is stunningly beautiful and the fishing is great and the people and food are great and the whole environment's great. So uh, it's so crazy because it really is. I mean, the, the thing I keep hearing is, you know, fishing is only a small part of these trips, really. It's it's the excuse to maybe do it. Yeah, but, yeah. If if it's if it's not going to be accompanied by, you know, some great people, some great scenery, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not interested. Right, right. No, that well, makes fishing, sense. Fishing is just a piece of it. Gotcha. All right, man. Well, Very thank you cool. so much. Thank you. You got it. All right. That's.